Me, um, I'm not here for first period, so I decided to make a little video for you. Um, after you watch this video and after you think about it a little bit, I want you to go directly to finishing your stories. Today is the day to finish your story. Remember, it's only a first draft. So bring it to a conclusion, get it done, and that's our first draft. We'll work on it, okay? You have to have something down. with And look at your plot diagram if you get stuck. Make sure you have your rising action, falling action, and your conclusion, all that good stuff with your story, okay? So now I'm going to close the window where you're looking at me, and I'm going to show you what the lesson that I wanted you to think about for today. Now, the lesson I want to talk about today is advice for writers writing a strong lead. So what is a strong lead? Well, let's talk about it. Um, a strong lead gets your readers excited about your story. I mean, that's kind of the deal. It draws them in, sets the stage, introduces key ideas. It also should start relatively close to the main event of the story. So let's take a look at the plot diagram for the two brothers skiing. You may remember that the older brother um, is kind of bummed because he always has to watch his little brother. And then uh, he says, let's go skiing. Um, the older brother kind of ditches the little brother. Little brother gets lost, and that's what happens. There's a ski patrol zooms by, and what's scary about the ski patrol zooming by is that on the back of the kind of sled is a kid in an orange, or a small person in an orange parka, and the older brother, um, Max, thinks it's his younger brother, Aaron. So what should happen in the lead for my story? These are things that absolutely should happen. It should be close to the main action, since this is a short story. If we were writing a book, maybe it would be farther from the main action. It should introduce Max and Arthur. It should present the problem that Max has to watch Arthur. Like, that's the big idea here. It should give some details about the main setting, the fact that they're skiing, um, the fact that it's outside. Um, it should include a fair amount of action, description, and dialogue. And it should reveal the internal thinking of the character subtly. So here's my first idea for a lead. And it's not good enough. We're going to look at it, um, and then we're going to evaluate it based on these things up here, these six things. All right. Max's mother knocked on his door. Max, wake up, honey. Damn, Max thought. I must have slept through my alarm. Jumping out of bed, Max pulled his duffel from the closet and started stuffing it full of ski clothes. His parents had told him that they would take him out of school early so they could beat the traffic to Tahoe, and he wanted to make sure he wasn't the one in the family holding everyone back. The traffic could be horrendous, and the last thing he wanted to do was spend six hours in a car next to his brother Aaron. Aaron tended to fall asleep on car rides. This was good and bad. It was good because Aaron wouldn't constantly intrude on, on oops, wouldn't constantly intrude on Max's thoughts with the inane little brother comments that came from an eight-year-old. It was bad, however, because Aaron's head always seemed to fall on Max's shoulder, and then if Max moved, Aaron would wake up cranky. To Max, it seemed like Aaron was a constant obligation. If Max was going out with friends, his parents made him take Aaron along. If the family wanted to watch a TV show, it had to be one that was appropriate for Aaron. Shoving his ski pants into the bag, Max was relieved that they'd be skiing. At least on the mountain, Max was free of constantly having to watch Aaron. As a pretty strong skier, Max was able to go on the hardest of runs. Aaron, a beginner who still made a pizza shape while he skied, could never keep up with him on K2. All right, let's take a look at my lead. Um, it's not so great. Because if I look at those six things, I only managed to do two of the six. It should happen close to the main action. No, it does not. It happens all the way back in Kenfield, where he's packing up for his trip. The main action happens on the mountain. It should tell the reader who Max and Arthur are. Yes, it does do that. It should present the problem that Max has to watch Arthur. Yes, it does do that. It should give some details about the main setting. Not really. It doesn't do that. It should include a fair amount of action, description, and dialogue. No, I don't think it does that either. Um, and it should reveal the internal thinking of the char character subtly. Um, no, I mean, it, it does tell you the, the uh, internal thinking, I guess, it does, of Max, but it doesn't do so subtly. Um, you don't want to necessarily just say, um, you know, this is Max's problem. Uh, you want to kind of reveal what Max's problem is slowly but surely. So um, let's take a look at another version of the lead. It's similar to the one that you've seen before, a little bit different. They neared the top of the first lift. The family of four squeezed onto one lift, um, uh, onto one, I'm going to change that, onto one chair. <clears throat> Max's dad turned. Max, man, I'm going to hang back with mom on green runs today. Her back is bothering her, so she doesn't want to push it. 
Stick with Aaron. I think he's ready for something a little more challenging than green runs. Max checked out the runs directly under the lift. A guy with a GoPro attached to his helmet did a helicopter over a small tree, <clears throat> sending puffs of snow up as he twirled. Max's father continued, Are you listening, Max? We need you to watch Aaron today on the mountain. You can go on some of the blue runs as long as they're smooth. Aaron can't handle the bumps. As if Max didn't know that. Aaron, his eight-year-old brother, could barely ride a skateboard, and sometimes he fell when he was running. I thought you were going to teach me how to handle big bumps today, Max thought. He started breathing heavily, hoping to keep his voice calm and even. It's not fair, he started. I always have to watch Aaron. When I was his age, I was put in ski school for entire days at a time. Why do I have to babysit him? His father pushed up the guardrail as the lift neared the end. Just do it, okay, Max? You don't need to argue about everything. They parted ways as Max continued to grumble. They'd meet at the bottom of the Alpine Express lift at 4 p.m. Where should we go, Max? Aaron said, squinting through his goggles. He was wearing Max's old orange parka, and it didn't fit him well. He could barely get his mittens out of the sleeves to hold the poles. All right, let's see how I did on this one um, with regards to my metric. It should happen close to the main action. Yes, it does do that now because soon after the parents leave and Aaron starts insisting that Max take him on some runs, Max is going to ditch him. It should tell the reader who Max and Arthur are. It does do that. It should present the problem that Max has to watch Arthur. It does do that. It should give some details about the main setting. It does that. It should include a fair amount of action, description, and dialogue. There's a lot more uh, dialogue here. There's a lot more description here. And um, there's some action, too. Not a ton of action, but, you know, lifting up the, the uh, guardrail, things like that. It should reveal the internal thinking of the character subtly. So it doesn't necessarily say explicitly, um, Aaron, uh, sorry, Max was really upset that he, could, that he was always stuck with Aaron. But it says, Dad, I thought we were going to ski together. Um, or when he's looking down at the guy with the GoPro, you can sort of get a sense of what Max is thinking. Um, it also does one other thing, which is kind of cool. If you remember the story, at the end of the story, or near the end of the story, Max sees his brother go, or not, he sees somebody um, with an orange parka. And he's like, oh, no. And it introduces the orange parka without being totally obvious that I was introducing the orange parka. All right, so let's take a look at the lead that a professional wrote. This one is from 13 and a half. And let's see what you think of it. All I knew about Ashley before I went over there yesterday was that until this year, she went to private school, and now she sits next to me in math. But she asked me over, and since I couldn't think of a good no, I said okay. Ashley lives near school, so we walked. We didn't have a lot to talk about on the way, but she didn't seem to mind. She was telling me that when she grows up, she wants to be a veterinarian and a movie star and travel all over the world very glamorously and live life to the hilt. She asked me if I like to live life to the hilt. I mostly just hang around, I admitted. But when you get older and you can do anything, she whispered as we began climbing the steep steps up to her huge stone house, what do you like to imagine? I was a little winded from the steps, so I just shrugged. Like, I'm constantly imagining I can fly, said Ashley, spreading her arms wide. Do you ever imagine you're flying? I stopped for breath. I sometimes imagine I'm in a bakery. All right, so does it do these things? It should tell the reader who the main characters are. Yep. It should present the problem that Ashley and the narrator aren't connected. It does do that. I mean, that is an issue with this play date, is that um, the narrator and Ashley don't even know each other, and it so totally does that. It should give some details about the main setting. It should include a fair amount of action, description and dialogue, and it should reveal the internal thinking of the character subtly. So it kind of shows you subtly that um, uh, the narrator and Ashley are awkward together, um, that uh, the narrator thinks this, is, this whole thing is a little bit weird. All right. So my question for you is where do you see these things? Take a look at the text here. Here's all the text on the screen, I think. Take a look at this text and talk with somebody next to you for one minute about what you notice. Where do you notice good things happening in each of the paragraphs? Okay, go ahead. I'll wait.
Keep looking at details. Every little line has a reason. Some of you have stopped. Keep looking. There's reasons for everything. Okay, walking around, I heard some great thinking from you guys. <laughs> That's a joke, because I'm not here, so clearly I didn't hear any thinking, but I hope you were thinking, because each of the lines in this has a real reason. Check this out. All I knew about Ashley before I went over there yesterday was that until this year, she went to private school, and now she sits next to me in math. But she asked me over, and since I couldn't think of a good no, I said, okay. This first paragraph reveals that the characters don't know each other very well. It also sets up the idea that the narrator can't really refuse things she doesn't want to do. And this comes in later when the narrator agrees to help bury the bird. Ashley lived near school, so we walked, but we didn't have a lot to talk about on the way. But she didn't seem to mind. She was telling me that when she grows up, she wants to be blah, blah, blah. She asked if I like to live life to the hilt. The second paragraph tells us that Ashley is a bit imaginative and odd. She's the kind of girl who would have a funeral for a pet bird. She also isn't socially very adept because she doesn't really care if the narrator speaks or not. This helps build the awkwardness because there's awkwardness between them and I think they get connected to each other anyway. Um, and this helps establish the awkwardness. Um, this one, I mostly just hang around, shows that uh, uh, the narrator is just a, a bit more realistic, I would say, than Ashley. But when you get older and you can do anything, she whispered as she began climbing the steps, what, what do you like to imagine? Huge stone house. So this shows how wealthy Ashley is. And her wealth is an interesting element in this whole story because it sets her apart from the narrator. But also, this is a girl who seems to have everything financially, but does not have the affection of her mom, which we learn later in the story. And then here, um, I, like I'm constantly imagining I can fly, said Ashley, spreading her arms wide. Do you ever imagine you're flying? Do you remember how the story ends? It ends with Ashley running around with her arms spread wide, kind of pretending she's flying. And it ends with the narrator saying, hey bird, I know you're in heaven now, but maybe you can come visit Ashley in her dreams because she really wants to fly. It all ties together like a little bow. And then this last line, I love it. I stop for breath. I sometimes imagine I'm in a bakery. That's just kind of a funny thing to say. The narrator shows her humor here. And there's going to be little wisps of uh, humorous observations that the narrator gives throughout this lead, or I'm sorry, throughout the story. So when you think about this lead, so much of it is purposeful. In fact, I'd kind of say all of it is purposeful, every single line. And that's what you're trying to do with your lead. You don't want to have a lead like this, that is just kind of like, yeah, all right, I just began my story. No, you really want to have a lead that does these things, right? And sets up your reader to be successful with your story. So the rest of the period, you are going to be working on your story silently. You are not going to be talking to each other. If you need a break, you can take a break and silent read. But you cannot just have conversations. This is the day to finish your story and keep improving it, keep improving it. Woohoo!